All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my channel. This is chan a channel for educational purposes. And uh, today is a video number 297 that we have done on the reciprocal system of theory, which is a theory of everything or a system of theory that was originated by Dewey B. Larson back in the 20th century. Uh, the main idea behind the reciprocal system of theory is that we live in a universe made entirely of motion. The universe is not made out of matter. It's not made out of energy either. It's made out of motion. Matter and energy are merely two different varieties of motion, as um, our acceleration and speed and pressure, electric current and electric charge, magnetic flux, resistance, viscosity. These are all forms of motion and they are all representable in uh, exclusively in terms of space and time. Uh, with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. This sets up a generalized reciprocal relationship between space and time. That is what a uh, uh, major insight that Larson had about motion is that uh, he defined motion as the relationship between space and time. And that is a reciprocal relationship. That's why he called his theory the reciprocal system of theory. Um, time and space do not exist in and of themselves. They only exist together in motion. And uh, Larson in the late 1950s put out his two fundamental postulates. The first of which is by far uh, the more important and uh, that basically is that the universe is composed entirely of uh, motion uh, in three dimensions. That's what he calls coordinate space and coordinate time. We recognize generally coordinate space, three dimensions of space. But uh, generally for us, three dimensions of time is some kind of blasphemy. Uh, I was almost kicked out of a physicist's office for even mentioning it one time. And, um, but that is what Larson calls coordinate time. And uh, all, all, quanti all qualities that exist in one also adhere to the other. So if space has three dimensions, that means that time also has three dimensions. Uh, and that uh, space... Time is progressing. Time is always getting later and later and later. This is what Larson refers to as a scalar motion. It's a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no particular direction. The clock is always getting later and later and later, but in no particular direction. And uh, space too uh, has that clock aspect of it always getting farther and farther and farther apart, but in no particular direction. You can envision this using a balloon with dots on it. You blow up the balloon, all the dots are moving away from each other, but in no specific direction. And this was also noticed uh, by the Hubble telescope that all of the distant galaxies are moving away from each other. Uh, so that is what Larson calls clock time and clock space. Then also space and time both have their discrete aspect. They come only in discrete units. They are quantized. There is a minimum unit of space and a minimum unit of time. If you don't have a full unit of space, then you don't have space. And if you don't have a full unit of time, then you don't have time. If you have exactly one unit of space in one unit of time, 
you have the speed of light. And the speed of light is what Larson calls unit speed. One over one equals one. The speed of light uh, for Larson is really the origin or the null point or the state of rest, uh, the zero point of his universe of motion. You have to understand that if you have a universe of motion, then you have to be able to uh, envision, imagine uh, motion without anything moving. Motion precedes anything that might be moving. And in fact, anything that might be moving is motion itself, because uh, matter is also a form of motion. Uh, in the time-space coordinates, matter is time to the third power over space to the third power. And so it's just another form of motion. Uh, and so uh, if you have the speed of light as the background or the uh, always existing, um, you know, uh, eternal and ubiquitous and uh, the, the uh, state of rest of the universe, then you, it's the, the reference point. You make your measurements from the speed of light. Uh, unlike uh, normal, uh, you know, legacy science, they make their measurements from zero. In the reciprocal system, you make your measurements from the speed of light. And as a reciprocal system, it is a multiplicative system. So where the, the uh, legacy scientists are saying plus one, plus two, plus three is balanced out by minus one, minus two, and minus three. In the reciprocal system, you, uh, you have a, a one as the center. And uh, in the positive direction, you have two, three, four, and five. In the negative direction, you have one half, one third, one fourth, and one fifth. So they multiply to one instead of adding to zero. And so with this boundary uh, of the speed of light, you have half the universe that's moving faster than the speed of light and half the universe that's moving slower than the speed of light. Generally, the scientists, legacy scientists, really only know about the half that's moving slower than the speed of light, evidenced by Einstein's dicta that the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. He's, uh, he's missing out on half of the universe. Now, fortunately, there's a way to catch up on that very quickly because, because of the reciprocal nature of uh, space and time, uh, whatever is going on in the material sector, in the sector of the universe moving slower than the speed of light, the exact same thing is going on in the cosmic sector, the sector that's moving faster than the speed of light. All you have to do is invert the roles of space and time. So in the material sector, uh, the sector that we're familiar with, the sector we make our measurements from, um, and observations, we see coordinate space, three dimensions of space, and clock time. The clock is always getting later and later and later. But if we crossed that speed of light boundary and we moved into the cosmic sector, we would perceive coordinate time, three dimensions of time, and we would perceive clock space. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. So we just have to invert the roles of space and time and we can extrapolate what's in the material sector over to the cosmic sector. And that uh, makes the uh, reciprocal system very powerful. Uh, you know, the fact that you can also use time and space units for all of the major scientific phenomena also uh, increases the power of the reciprocal system. Uh, Larson, so Larson 
I'll put out these, uh, this fundamental postulate along with the second one, which basically just says that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics and its uh, magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. Uh, there has been some dispute about that from some of the insiders. But uh, regardless, he took those two postulates and he, uh, through a process of long process of deduction that I've gone through on some of my uh, uh, a series of 15 videos earlier on, in this, uh, on this channel about eight months ago, um, he deduced an entire theoretical universe, how the uh, entire universe operates just from those two fundamental postulates. And uh, that, those videos are called the outline of the deductive development of the reciprocal system. And uh, you can check those out uh, on my channel. But uh, anyway, so uh, from those deductions, he wrote uh, all his books, uh, books on chemistry and physics and astronomy, but also on uh, some liberal arts topics uh, social sciences, uh, economics, and um, metaphysics, and philosophy, and religion, and psychology, and biology. Uh, he has contributions to all those fields. And uh, he died back in 1990, left behind a small following. And uh, we are going to be looking at one of the articles written by one of his um, adherents, Dr. K.B.K. Nehru, who along with Dr. Bruce Perrette has been probably the most prolific of uh, Larson's, um, I won't say disciples, but you know, people that uh, have uh, taken Larson's theory and tried to expand upon it. And they expanded to the such an extent that they came up with what was called the RS2, the reciprocal system two, the re-evaluation of the reciprocal system, where they took really the spirit of the reciprocal system, but uh, corrected a few of the errors that Larson made in his derivations. His uh, ultimate theory uh, was correct. Uh, that's what Larson would say. His theory is correct whether I have applied my theory correctly in every case is a different matter. He was subject to error even by his own uh, reckoning and uh, knew that uh, eventually his mistakes would come to light. Um, and so uh, Nehru and Perret have uh, done a lot of work to kind of shore up some of the weaknesses of the reciprocal system. We're looking at Dr. Nehru's article called The Space-Time Universe. I believe this is the fourth video that we've done on this paper. So if you want to go back to the start of the paper, you want to go back about three videos. Um, but we're going to uh, look, I think uh, Nehru uh, classifies a number of the, uh, what he calls outstanding achievements of the reciprocal system. And right now he's going to explain, uh, or he's going to talk about gravity as one of those. The explanation of gravity is outstanding achievement number three of the theory. Quote, the gravitational motion of each mass carries the mass inward in space time. Since all other masses are similarly moving inward in space time, each mass moves toward all other masses. Such a motion needs no medium, nor does it require a finite time for propagation. The inward motion is an inherent property of the atoms, and there is no propagation. Now again, you would just kind of perceive this as an inward scalar motion. So uh, you go back to your uh, visualization of the balloon with dots on it. When you blow up the balloon, all the dots move away from each other. But when you suck in the balloon, all the dots move toward each other. That is uh, something on the order of gravity. Um, now you can add in the interior that it, you can think of um, something like uh, raisin bread, where you 
put the raisin bread in the oven and as it rises all of the raisins move away from each other um, somehow I guess if you you know if you put it in the freezer instead of the oven or something all the raisins then would be move toward each other that would be another representation of uh, gravity further we can understand why our experience of time is so different from our experience of space. Our consciousness is associated with material bodies and the reciprocal system shows that atoms of matter are time structures, net displacements in time. Even though space actually progresses outward at the same rate as time, the outward motion which the space progression imparts to objects in existing in this local environment is more than counterbalanced by the inward movement due to gravitation. And we seem to see a stationary space. Okay, so I, I, I don't know why I'm wanting to restate all this, but because he, he says it well, but I'm just trying to uh, give you another uh, viewpoint there. Uh, so, you know, the space-time progression, Larson calls the progression of the natural reference system, is a mover, movement outward in space and outward in time at, all, at the speed of light. But because we are in this kind of gravitationally bound system, we are um, atoms of matter we are uh, in the, you know, material bodies, uh, which are time structures. And so um, we, st we perceive the progression of time. We perceive the outward movement of time at the speed of light. But we do not perceive the outward movement of space at the speed of light because that motion is counterbalanced or more than counterbalanced by the inward motion of gravity in space. Okay, so um, if we were outside of a gravitational uh, field or outside of grav the effect of gravitation, uh, way, way, way out in space, then we would also perceive the progression of space. And, you know, again, that's shown that all the Hubble telescope identified that all of the distant galaxies are moving um, away from each other. The farther they are, away from each other, the faster they are moving until they get to a certain point where uh, gravity is completely negligible from our viewpoint. And at that point, all of the distant galaxies are moving away from each other at the speed of light. Or even perhaps, you know, faster than that. Um, not quite sure how that works. Okay. Um, even though, okay. On the other hand, the progression of time is not abated since matter itself is a time structure. Thus, we experience in one second, the equivalent of 300 million meters of space. The concept of physical entities as compound motions is one of the greatest contributions which the reciprocal system makes toward the clarification of the physical picture. This must be obvious to anyone who is familiar with the tenets of occult science. We can turn to the Mahatma letters or the secret doctrine for bountiful quotations. 
And again, Nehru is pulling in uh, some occult uh, references that, um, you know, Larson was not familiar with, but um, they seem to be drawing similar conclusions. The current scientific view that the atom is a composite structure built up of smaller units stems from the impression that if we can get particles out of an atom, as in radioactivity, for example, then there must be particles in atoms. Once parts of an atom in the above sense are posited, it naturally becomes necessary to conjure up forces to hold them together. And Larson rightly reminds us that no clue has ever been discovered as to the nature and origin of the force that holds the parts of the atom together. The outstanding achievement number four of the reciprocal system is to explain how the parts of the atom hold together. There is nothing to explain because the atom has no separate parts. It is one integral unit. And the special and distinctive characteristics of each kind of atom are not due to the way in which separate parts are put together, but are due to the nature and magnitude of the several distinct motions of which each atom is composed. The original meaning of atom as it is justified, after all. Now, um, basically, the atom is just one thing. Um, but it is a combination of motions. It's not a combination of particles, but it is a combination of motions. So in general, the atom is composed of uh, two-dimensional two rotations and possibly one one-dimensional uh, rotation. And uh, Larson would used used to make the analogy that the atom is like a curveball. The curveball has motion in space in, you know, as you throw it, it goes in space, it goes through space, but it it's also moving, rotating in and of itself. So, um, those are two different motions, but the curveball itself is just one thing. Okay, so that's kind of uh, an analogy that Larson used to describe the atom. It's like a curveball. It's, it, it's got different kinds of motion, uh, you know, inherent in it, but it is only one thing. Okay, um... The two opposite motions, the ever-present outward scalar progression of space-time and the inward scalar progression, that is gravity, govern the course of the physical phenomena throughout the universe. Since the effect of gravitation diminishes with distance, while the background outward space-time progression is constant at unit speed, as it originates everywhere, we find that up to a certain distance, which Larson calls the gravitational limit, from a gravi uh, gravitating uh, material aggregate, like a galaxy, the net motion is inward. Beyond the gravitational limit, the space-time progression becomes greater than gravity, and the net motion is outward. Uh, and then I would just add that there's another gravitational limit further out where gravity becomes totally negligible. Um, and so then the, uh, not only is the net motion outward, but it is outward at the speed of light. Okay, this manifests to us as the recession of the distant galaxies from each other and gives the linear relationship between the speed of recession and the distance known as the Hubble's Law. 
There is absolutely no need to resort to an ad hoc hypothesis like the one popular with the astronomers that the universe started from a Big Bang. The logical explanation of the galactic recession can be claimed as the outstanding achievement number five of the reciprocal system. Okay, uh, I think we're going to stop right there. We did number three, four, and five, and uh, we will get into uh, more here. We'll be going back to looking at gravity a little bit more, and then um, a discussion of electricity and magnetism. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, Dr. Perrette revised a lot of Larson's stuff on electricity and magnetism. And um, Nehru, this article was written in 1981. And so I don't really know if Nehru ended up adjusting some of his ideas at a certain point or uh, whether he was already kind of uh, had questions about some of Larson's stuff. In particular, Nehru was instrumental in um, changing Larson's concept of the photon um, from one of being a combination of an oscillating motion with a translational motion uh, to one of being a combination of two counter-rotations or bi-rotations. Uh, but we will uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, and uh, we'll get into this next, uh, I guess, outstanding achievement number six, uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, I understand that this material is abstract and difficult, um, but the reward is great. Um, even somebody like me, I don't fully understand the system, obviously, but... I have gotten just, uh, I feel like, great rewards from even trying to understand it. And uh, it has definitely changed my perspective about so many things. Uh, even though, you know, I know that it's not, it's just a work in progress. Um, the more people that are working on this stuff, the uh, more progress that can be made. And... Um, you know, I think it's just kind of thrilling to work uh, on this and, and to almost stand in awe of Larson and also Perrette and Nehru for taking this on um, because it's, you know, so all-encompassing. And, uh, you know, Larson dealt with absolutely nothing but hostility and, and resistance from the scientific community for his the whole time that he was working on this and so that is also an inspiration to me to be sp uh, spreading this trying to spread this and um so i'm just saying that you know if you want to learn uh you know chemistry and organic organic chemistry and uh astronomy astrophysics and physics you know uh, you go to school for that, it's, you know, you're not going to pick it up from a 20 minute video. Uh, you got to study for years and you got to, you know, really persevere and stick to it and everything. So, you know, if you watch one video and you say, oh, well, this sounds too difficult for me. Well, maybe it is, but maybe you're just giving up a little bit too early and you just need to stick with it a little bit um, because, um, you know, our society tends to, tends to uh, be toward the in, uh, immediate gratification and, uh, you know, they want everything on a silver platter. Unfortunately, you know, most of the great treasures are not on a silver platter. You have to dig and uh, this requires a good deal of digging. Um, but it is, um, a lot of the work has been done and uh, we need to appreciate that and uh, build on it. Okay, so uh, thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.